Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be here. And of course, we are remembering the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And of course, it was not a situation in Berlin. It was a situation of Europe. And without Solidarność, Gorbachev would not have been elected. He was elected with one vote more. And uh, of course, the singing revolution in the Baltic states. And Solidarność has had 10 million members, and the Communist State Party in Poland has had 2.5 million. And they made it, and Carta 77 in Czechoslovakia, and the opposition in the GDR, they changed the world. And I always say, the politicians in East and West have reacted. They had to react. What people have done, they changed the world. And for that, I made then, in, before I was in the European Parliament, about 15 years here in the city-state parliament of Berlin. I was elected in January 1989 for West Berlin. There was the wall already. And uh, then we wanted to have an initiative for the, where the wall used to be, there should be a bike train. But at that time, it was not possible. The wall should be erased. But you can't erase history. And 10 years later, when there was the 40th anniversary of the building of the wall, out of the opposition, I get a majority for this project. It is now signposted in Berlin, built in a bicycle-friendly manner, and a touristic highlight, because 80% of the tourists coming to Berlin are coming because of the history, not the short history, also the longer one. We have a lot of history in this city. And when I was elected in the European Parliament, 2004, I got, because not only Berlin was divided, it was the continent as well, I got a big majority in the European Parliament from all the countries and all the groups for the Iron Curtain Trail, that is the continuation of the Berlin Wall Trail along the western border of the Warsaw Pact states. And all the countries are working on it. 10,000 kilometers long, run through 20 countries, and 15 of them now are member states of the European Union. And if I would have told you that 30 years ago, you would have said that I myself, crazy guy, continue dreaming. But that is our reality, and therefore, that is a right in history, politics, culture, and nature. It is okay when I stay here? Or? Sorry, yeah. yeah. So that is the situation in Berlin. When I first came to Berlin in 1963, you see the wall 40 kilometers, and surrounding West Berlin, there was the wall 120 kilometers. And it was called anti-fascist anti protection wall. And I said, that is a blame for all the anti-fascists which risked their lives in Nazi time in Germany. But that was the name of the wall in the GDR. We are looking for the memorials, for the victims. Here you see Peter Fechter was one of the first one, and Chris Gefgoy was the last one. On the 5th of February, 1989, he was shot down. His friend was kept and he was shot down from the front. They could have taken him as well. But they shouldn't be anonymous. We want to know them. And there are the materials of the victims of the wall on the sidewalk, uh, on the side of uh, to Brandenburg. And you see here a stele. And in the stele, you find a picture of the situation with the wall, a picture of the victim. And the stele is 3.6 meter high because the wall, as well, as well was 3.6 meters high. And of course, we have the miles of history of the Berlin Wall that here is in four languages, German, English, French, and Russian. And you see here uh, a memorial for Georg Elsa, who tried to kill Adolf Hitler in 1938, but he was not successful. And there is where the wall used to be. There is now a double cobblestone along the wall between East and West Berlin. And you see Berlin Wall between 1961 and 1989. That was the Potsdamer Platz in 1962. Nearly nothing. There was the wall. And the opening of the wall at Potsdamer Platz on the 12th of November 1989, the two mayors of East and West Germany and I myself in the background, you can't recognize me, but I never forget this day. And Weinhaus Hut, that was the only building which has survived the war. All the others have been destroyed. 
and today it is integrated, is protected, and that is good. The oldest watchtower on Potsdamer Platz, it should be erased, but we made an initiative to save it, so it was only moved by 10 meters, but it is now still there, and we are happy about that. <coughs> Niederkirchner Straße, that is the old Prussian parliament, and now there is the Abgeordnetenhaus of Berlin, and you see the wall before and behind, both walls, and in the middle there was the, the, the road for the troops of the GDR, and yeah. And Checkpoint Charlie, you know the situation, and in October 1961 there was a threat that there would be the Third World War, World War because the tanks of Soviet Union and the Americans have been together, but they found a solution. Checkpoint Charlie, there is now an open air exhibition, and never forget Mstislav Rostropovich, who saved Zakharov, and he had to leave the Soviet Union. And he wanted, when the wall came down, he ordered a flight to Berlin and played there the Bach suites on his cello. And that was great. And he said, that was necessary for my life. I never forget this because, you know, I'm a cyclist, and it was forbidden to go by bike from West to East Berlin. But on the 12th of November, for the first time in my life, it was possible, and we did it, with Michaela Schreier, she was senator and one of uh, the administration here. Eastside Gallery, when the wall came down, all the artists from all over the world came to Berlin. And that was the same when the wall was built. All the artists came all over the uh, world to West Berlin, and they make a the sculpture you can see in the garden near uh, the, the Chancellor House. And of course, the artists, they made the gap, they closed the gap between the beginning and the fall of the wall. Oberbaumbrücke, that was, uh, it's a very nice bridge that at the cross crossing point. It was only a little bit repaired. Now it is in the old situation. And Elsenstraße, Neukölln, and there was written down, uh, never, if you don't accept, if you accept the wall, if you don't accept the wall, never it will fall down. When everybody says, okay, the wall will be 100 years, then it was a time that it could fall down, and that was written down on the wall. The Massante Brücke in Neukölln, via the Telto Canal, in the middle, there was a border, and in the middle of the bridge, there was a wall, today not. And the remnants of the wall, that was a big mistake. They wanted to erase nearly everything. But two persons said no. One was Willy Brandt. On the 10th of November 1989, on the John F. Kennedy Platz, he said, and let us, let us save some, pass, uh, some peaks of this monstrum for future generations like we have done with the ruins of the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche. And today they saved it, and it is a monument of the Second World War. And the other one was Michaela Schreier. She was senator of the Green Party. And when, she, when all the people came from all over the world to click on the wall, she saved it and protected the wall in the Niederkirchener Straße. And when she did it, she was criticized. The Greens are crazy. They want to build up the wall. But today, everybody is happy about the remnants of the wall because everybody is asking, where was the wall? Not only the, the tourists, also the Berliners. There is a monument on the Kirchheiner Damm. And there was an initiative, citizens' initiative from Japan, because the cherry is very important in Japan. And they planted these trees in some parts of the former death strip. And you see the flowers, the, the blossoms in May. That is great. And that was Telto Canal. Also in the middle, there was a wall. And that was the exclave Steinstücken. It was an island in the GDR. It belongs to West Berlin. And later on, it was connected with a road. Before, you had to pass twice the control if you go there. The Glienica Brücke, the bridge was called Bridge of Unity, but it was a bridge of division. 
Sacro Heilandskirche, very important, and it was, you could see from the western part, on the eastern part you are not allowed to go there. Today it is renovated and in a good scape. Church of the village Altstarken, you see the church was not destroyed, lots of churches have been destroyed, but there is a wall and the watchtower and today it is renovated as well. Watchtower near Nieder Neuendorf. You see here the people living there didn't know that there is a river because they couldn't only see, could only see the wall. Today this uh, tower was saved and it is now a monument. The ducks built in Reinickendorf. For years it was, today it belongs to uh, Brandenburg as well, but there was surrounded by the wall and it was not possible to go there, but today it is. Wollangstraße, you see there were the houses and di directly before there was a wall, today the wall is gone. Bornholmer Brücke, the famous bridge where the wall came down tomorrow, 30 years ago, and of course now it is open. Bernauer Straße, 1936, 63, that was very important. The first time when I was in Berlin and my aunt gave me a camera and the first photos in my life I made from this podest with this house on the corner. And later on when I came to West Berlin, I always moved to this place to see how the wall was changed. You see here, now the windows and the doors are closed. Then it was the facade of the house was the building, the, was a, the wall, and in the 80s, in the middle 80s, it was repaired or it was uh, by the modern wall. This church was destroyed in 1985 and today on the basement there is now a new chapel and there tomorrow there is also uh, a meeting. Window of remembrance in the Bernauer Straße with all the victims that they have a picture there. And Kaninchenzeichen, the rabbits and the Chausseestraße, they are able 28 years to go from east to west and west to east. They were the only ones. And Parliament der Bäume of Bemwagin, he made this parliament shortly after the wall came down and it is saved. It was a big fight because they are the only remnants of the wall in the government center. Eight, 58 remember, uh, monuments of the wall and they are now, two years ago, they are protected. He made the segments of the wall from 1949 to 1989 and in each year you see the, with the number the people which are killed on the wall and in 1953, 25, that was the highest number. The Rep Reichstag, you know, that was the first monument here when East and West could remember in the same way. Before the East have remembered other e events and the West also, but this was the first one and both sides of the Berlin, of Berlin have been very happy. The Brandenburg Gate shortly after the building of the wall, it was not the wall, it was a fence. The fence was bought from the GDR, from a co Cologne industry manager and shortly before the wall came down and you see the Brandenburg Gate nearly nothing all around was destroyed during the war and you see the wall. Of course, you find segments of the wall all over the world in the Garden of the United Nations in New York and in the, in the Park Leopold in Brussels. When I was for breakfast in the parliament, I looked outside, I saw the red segment of the wall, I felt at home. Yeah, and I wrote books about it in German and in English. And that was a model for the European event a ride through European history from the Barents Sea to the Black Sea on the western border of the former Warsaw Pact states, 10,000 kilometers and runs to, through 20 countries and 15 of them are now member states of the European Union. The route as close as possible to the border, as comfortable as possible, 10 kilometers on the, on the stones with 36 holes, I have done, never again, I will not recommend to you, and uh, avoiding high frequented roads, frequently crossing the former border to have a feeling today, 
it is not possible to show your passport. 30 years ago, it was not possible. And to integrate numerous monuments. I got a big majority in the European Parliament. The Iron Curtain trade should be supported as an example of soft mobility and as a symbol of the unification of Europe with a big majority from all the countries and all the groups. And after this decision, the Commission made workshops in Warsaw and Sopron and in Sofia, and all the 20 countries involved have been present by tourism organizations, bicycle organizations, or the ministries. And all the 20 countries are working on it. The northern part on the Russian-Norwegian border, the Russian-Finnish border, and the Baltic coast in Russia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Kaliningrad, Exclave, Poland, and the former GDR. That is Norway, the Grenze Jakobself, the river and the small village, the watchtower is on the Russian side, the yellow pillar is on the Norwegian side. Kekenes, and you can cycle on the road. And I always say in Finland and Norway, the bike lanes are called road because every half an hour there is a car. It is very comfortable to make it. Sometimes you have to stop because the reindeers, and of course they have priority, and if there is a reindeer on the road, all the cars are stopping, and they are looking, what are they doing? If they see a cyclist, they are feeling the same. I was so safe in Finland when there was a car, I never had been angry. That is a monument in Suomussalmi, remembering <coughs> the winter war. It was 105 days. It starts on the 30th of November 1939, and there are 105 clocks. And the monument is done by Russian and Finnish people. They created it together. Today you can't imagine. But it is very important that they remember both the situation, because the winter war in Russian history doesn't play a role with the Second World War. That is a problem because you will find a monument, Second World War in Russia, from 1941 to 1945. They don't mention the winter war in Finland <coughs> and the attack of Poland on the 17th of September 1939, because on the 1st of September, Poland, Germany attacked Poland, and from the other side, the Red Army, and in the middle, when they met, they made a victory fate. And we have to look for each day of the history in Europe. Of course, Russia, Weborg, and the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg, the Eremitage. Estonia, the Nava River, marks the border between the European Union and Russia. And Tallinn, a wonderful city, is UNESCO protected area with the old wall and the towers. It is fantastic. <clears throat> And never forget this, on the 50th anniversary of the Hitler-Stalin Pact, it is called the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact in East Europe, the longest citizen chain all over mankind of people, and they made it 600 kilometers from Tallinn via Riga to Vilnius to fight for the independence, and some two years later, they have done it. The Freedom Monument in Riga, it is very important because Latvia, Latvia was only independent until 1991 for 20 years. And in these 20 years, they made this monument. And there was a decision of the Central Committee of the Communist State Party to erase it. But the daughter of the architect can, had made it. So it is saved. And if you are a politician and go to Riga, you have to go to this monument and you know why. And there is a museum of occupation in Riga, and you see the secret part of the Hitler-Stalin Treaty where the two dictators <coughs> agreed how to do divide Eastern Europe. <coughs> and 50 years the Holocaust didn't play a big role, but now it is the same. 2,500 Jews were killed near Lepaya, and there is now the monument, the Seven Lamb Memorial. Memel, Kleipeda, and with Entchen von Tarau, and that is a cottage house from Thomas Mann. He could finance it when he got the Nobel Prize. But then shortly, he was two or three times in this house. He had to leave Germany, Nazi Germany, and go to the United States. And his successor in this house was Hermann Göring. 
Kaliningrad, of course, Kant Memorial and the Cathedral, and Kaliningrad was, was destroyed by 90%. Surrounding the cathedral were houses. There is all now a, a, a wood, but the, uh, the dome of the cathedral is now renovated in a good stage. Poland, city center of Gdansk. I mentioned the situation of Solidarność, very important for us. And the Solidarność Memorial in Gdansk was done during communist time. In 1980-81, when Solidarność was very strong, they made this and they saved it. And there's now also a big museum of Solidarność. Central Europe, the former German-German border and the borders between Czech Republic, Germany and Austria, and Slovakia and Austria. That is near Travemünde, you see the fence, the watchtowers, the pillars. 20 years later, <coughs> nature had recovered this area, and you can't imagine that here was a very dangerous border in Europe. The Elbe was a border between East and West Germany. You see on the left side the petrol boat, the watchtower. Today, there's a ferry boat, so the Elbe is not a dividing river, it is a connecting river. The same with the Werra was also the border between East and West Germany, and on the basement of a bridge which was destroyed by German troops in the last days of the Second World War, there was the Watchtower. Today, there is a bridge, also the Werra is a connecting river. And Point Alpha, it was the most western point of the Warsaw Pact states, and the NATO thought, if there is an attack from Soviet Union, they start there to Frankfurt and then to the North Sea. So on the other side, there was a big camp of NATO. And you see here now the two watchtowers and the Iron Curtain in between, that the difference is 50 meters. But that was the situation. All should be erased, but then there was an initiative of people, and they said, now, no, no, we want to save it. Today, it is a national monument of the division and the connecting of Europe. That was the situation. The nature was destroyed, but now you see on the right side uh, the trees in the middle are not as high as, as the border, and they are greener. In 10 years or 20 years, you will, do, you will not see a difference. And Mödlareuth, it was called Little Berlin. Two small villages dividing by a small creek. For hundreds of years, it didn't play a role where they are, but then Germany was divided and there was a wall like in Berlin, and therefore it was called Little Berlin. But they are clever. They saved a lot of the remnants, and today they suffered 28 years when Germany was divided by the wall. But today, lots of tourists are coming there. They want to look how was a division in, in Germany. <coughs> the southern part, along the border between Hungary and Austria, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, Romania, Serbia, and Bulgaria, Serbia, North Macedonia, Greece, and Turkey. Czech Republic, memorial near Svati Kris, with all the names of the victim on the border, and that was the Iron Curtain near Hep around 1980. In Googlewald in Austria, there was the Iron Curtain, but there is now a monument with plaques and information and pictures, and the remnants of the barbed wire in Slovakia. Hungary, Schopron, of course, there was uh, the pan-European picnic, and there is the memory, open door memorial in Schopron, and on the right side, you never forget the two foreign ministers when they cut the Iron Curtain. But what was the reason? The militaries in Hungary in 1987 said, we want to erase the wall, because they made an analysis that 90% of the alarms was done by, by uh, uh, by animals and by wind. And 90% of the refugees have not been Hungarians because they have had a passport. They could make it. And then they said, to modernize it, 20 million. To erase it, 3 million. Therefore, the military said, OK, we want to erase. But the government didn't know how Gorbachev react. He said that it's up to the member states how to do it. And on the 2nd of May, they started to erase it. And that was small news in the newspapers, but not more. And then the foreign minister of Austria, Alois Mock, said, no, no, we have to do it again, then with a picture. And then the military said, the first row of the Iron Curtain is already has disappeared. 
So they made the second road, road and there they made it this picture and that runs over the world. Yeah, in Croatia, the cycle path on the dam of the river Drava and a uh, watchtower near Kapinci and the memorial memory of the Second World War. And if you are a German in the former Yugoslav state, you will recognize what the Germans have done in the Second World War. And that was very, very ugly. And it's good that we are remembering. Because I always quote Wilhelm von Humboldt. He said, only the one who knows the past will have a future. We all want to have a future. Therefore, we have to look at the past. Serbia, Tabula Trajana, that was a, a road along the Danube and the Decibal sculpture, the biggest stone sculpture, now it was done 2000 to 2004 on the other side of the Danube. And that was a bridge 2000 years ago. The Romans did this bridge. But today you only find, can see some pillars. Yeah, the war monument near Halovo and in Bulgaria, the watchtower near Halovo. Uh, it is not protected, but it is already there. And I wish that all the remnants are protected. Macedonia, the border near Novo Selo, you see nearly like the German-German border. Yugoslavia was a communist state, but it didn't belong to the Warsaw Pact states. Why? Because Tito fought with his partisans against the German and Italian fascists without support of Stalin. But when he was successful, Stalin wanted to dictate what is in Yugoslavia. And then Tito said in 1948, no. That was a big, big risk, risk for him, and therefore it didn't belong to the Warsaw Pact states and founded the, <coughs> the movement with e Egypt and uh, India. And yeah, that was the old border post closed. And I can tell you, the soldiers of Yugoslavia, they didn't kill a refugee. When there was somebody who is swimming through the Danube or the Drava, and then on the other side, the Bulgarian, the Romanian shot Yugoslavian, they made warning shots in the, in the air, and then they stopped, and so they saved some refugees. There are the watchtowers. The left, left one is already there. On the Bulgarian side, it is erased. And for Hupel, that was a Metaxas line, 26 force were on the border of Greece because they thought there will be an attack from Bulgaria. But this force they could, that was necessary when the Germans invade, made the invasion in Greece. This bridge, 500 years old, via the Evros, that is the river between uh, Greece and Turkey. And on, it is always the borderline, but seven kilometers near Edirne, it is not a borderline. And there is this wonderful bridge. And if you cycle over this bridge, that is great. That is a feeling 500 years ago. Edirne, the minarets, the, the mosque with the highest minarets. And then you see on the, the old Iron Curtain on the Bulgarian Turkish side, you see the front fence and the behind fence. And then later on, there is a new fence. And when I cycled there, I had a feeling like in Berlin when I cycle along the wall. That is against the refugees. Today, that from Turkey, nobody can go to Bulgaria. 30 years ago, the fence was that nobody can go from Bulgaria to Turkey. That is the watchtower on the Black Sea. On the left side is the Bulgarian and the Turkish one. And the Green Belt Initiative, and it is protected by the Green Belt Initiative, and it is the patron is the president of the Green Cross International, and since 1996, 1992, it is Mikhail Gorbachev. He knows the situation very well. And for the Iron Curtain Trail, I got the patrons, that is Lech Walensa, he agreed, and Michaela Birtler, uh, Marianne Birtler, she was an activist in the GDR. And Václav Havel, shortly before he died, he agreed to be the patron of this Iron Curtain Trail, of this right in history, politics, culture, and nature. And I'm very happy, and I couldn't find better persons than these three, that they are the patrons of this project. Oh, and last year, on the Biennale in Venice, it was the Iron Curtain 
was a model on the German pavilion, and you could see it. And this year, it was done, that is a, now a cultural route, the Council of Europe, with 46 member states, they have decided to make it, and I got <coughs> this, this uh, uh, certification on the 2nd of October in Sibiu, in Romania, and now that is the first Eurovelo route, which is, al which is also a cultural route. About this, I wrote books. Ten years ago, it was three books, then I made a review, and doing the review, I have cycled all the 10,000 kilometers by myself, and it's now in English and in German. In the book, you find, of course, the map, the description of the route, you find a summary of the history of each country, and of course, where you can stay overnight, all is done, and of course, stories and history within, and because today, there are five books with a, with a German border trail that are six books in the shop. They cost 100 euros. Today, I have some with me. You will get it for half of it for 50 euros. If you are int interested, please let me know. And then I thank you very much for the attention. And I think with the time of the show. <laughs> I'm Maeva, I'm a student from the ICD, and I think like um, uh, this discussion uh, about greener and climate change is something that is, uh, people are more and more aware today, especially with uh, what happened uh, with Greta Thunberg and also the movements that we see today in Berlin. So we also had uh, uh, the mayor of Helsinki that uh, talked about how um, cities have a greater uh, role in how to make greener cities and smarter cities. So I would like to ask, uh, what is your opinion on how uh, the European Parliament can also foster uh, these kinds of policies? The European Parliament is very good in this case. They want to do it. They want to save the nature. But it is up to the member states where they invest. You will not find an investment without the money of the member states. But 60% of the money in the transport sector in the member states is going to road, only 20% to rail, and 0.7 is going to the bicycle infrastructure. There you can do. But in the cities, it is very important because the transport sector in Europe is responsible for 25% of all the CO2 emissions. In the cities, it is 40%, and if you look all to the other uh, emissions which are damaging the climate, in the cities, transport is responsible for 70% of all the emissions which are damaging the climate. And if you know, in German cities, 90% of all the distances made by car are less than six kilometers. That is an ideal distance to change to bus, to train, to tram, to go by bike, to go on foot. And that is a possibility. I'm convinced you can save the mobility and the climate. Both is necessary for the future. If there is a will, you can do it. If I would have told you 20 years ago in Copenhagen, now 60% of the people will go in by bike to work, you would have said, crazy guy, continue dreaming. But that is now reality. They did it. Their Greta Thunberg is right. We don't need wordings. We need facts. Make it. Hi, uh, my name is Charity. I'm a student with the HFU. First off, thank you for being here. Uh, my question for you is, um, do you think that preserving these historical sites serves as more of a, a warning for history never to repeat itself, or more of a celebration as how far Europe, more so Germany, has come? It is not a celebration for Germany. It is a celebration for Europe. I mentioned at the beginning, all the people surrounding, they changed the world. Never forget, and therefore I quote Wilhelm von Humboldt, only the one who knows the past will have a future. And you must know the past that it will not be repeated. I learned the situation in the Second World War. I'm the first generation in Germany which has no war. My father has one war, my grandfather's two wars. And that is great. And we have to know it 
exactly what was happened and what was possible to avoid. And if we do it, then the situation of a division and, of course, of this bad situation will not be repeated. I remember, of course, the very, very bad situation of the, divide, of the division of Europe, but I remember also the wonderful overcome of this division by the peaceful revolution without a war. Nobody of my generation could imagine that that would be possible. That was done by the people, and that we have to remember all together. Hi, my name is Shreyas, and I'm a student at the ICD as well. Um, it's, this is an extension of the question uh, which my colleague Maeva asked uh, a while back. Um, Jan, uh, Mr. Jan uh, uh, mentioned that uh, Helsinki, he's taken up the initiative to make Helsinki a functional city, a smart city. And um, I wanted to know if the European Union, if the EU Parliament is keen on on, on extending this, a, a similar sort of scheme, uh, a similar sort of scheme for other cities in, uh, like other big cities in Europe, like the capital cities, like maybe um, in the capital of Norway, the capital of other Scandinavian nations as well. Is there a is there a plan in place, or are there any thoughts about it? Thank you. On the European level, yeah. we have a level which part of emissions is allowed and which is not allowed. And I can tell you, in Germany, lots of cities are now blamed by the European Commission because they didn't follow the law, what Germany has supported, but long time ago. And that is very important. And the next thing, I like to quote Hans-Jochen Vogel. He was a social democrat, and he was a very young mayor of Munich. Nearly 50 years ago, in 1972, he said, the car is murdering our city. If all cars are electric and all power comes from renewables, the murdering of the city will continue. Therefore, we need three parts. Avoiding, changing, and better technical solutions. But I will not that the cities are murdering. Therefore, we have to change mobility to public transport, to bicycle, and so on and so on. In Berlin, we have 15% which are cycling. But the space in the city is 3%. That is very, very unfair. Or the railways pay on each kilometer of track, each lo locomotive in Europe has to pay a, roll, a toll. On the road is the free will of the member states if they have it. So 3% of the road is tolled and 100% of the rail. If the rail would be environmentally damaging, that would be OK. But the opposite is the case. So we have to change. And the main thing is politics. They have to look at it and make facts. No wording. <coughs> so shall we move the 